Hi, welcome back to Future Fast. And once again, we have a very interesting guest. And before I bring today's guest, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, your feedback and uh, following and also sharing of uh, Future Fast. I really appreciate uh, your support. And uh, also, I welcome more interactions. Uh, uh, we bring uh, very different uh, guests with uh, very different expertise and efforts that they are putting on internationally. So I uh, really urge you to take advantage of engaging them as well in the conversation. So with that, today's guest is Vicky Chan. He's an architecture architect, and he runs a very interesting uh, thing. We'll hear about it. He's the founder of Architecture for Children. So, uh, and of course, there's more facets to Vicky and uh, we'll uh, discover it in his own words. Vicky, once uh, welcome to Future Fast. Thank you so much for making time to be here with us and uh, uh, offering to share your journey with us. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it has been a you know, pleasure to get to know you over the internet. And I'm very glad that I get to share my journey with uh, you and your audience. Uh, I'm quite excited for, for this podcast. Wonderful, Vicky. Thank you. So uh, maybe uh, we could start with what got you to think of becoming an architect? Okay. Uh, I was actually very good with like, art and I'm also relatively good uh, in math. Uh, so when I was a bit younger, my art teacher kind of suggested that uh, this could be a career where I could combine two of my talents. Uh, and as I get to work on more art pieces, uh, such as like, some really big um, community art mural that were helping the high school I was in uh, to kind of like engage the student to really activate some of this like public art in the school. I get to understand that your know, architecture could eventually become my medium to expand my footprint, uh, to expand the, the things that I love, uh, and to also find a bigger platform to exercise my creative freedom. Well, uh, uh, that's very interesting. I, I just want to dig a little further into it. Uh, see, uh, there is a, uh, in India, I'm from India, I live in Bangalore, which you know. So uh, in India, we have, uh, even there is a god for architecture. Oh. Right? <laughs> so uh, uh, what what are the historical or, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, the influences you think that are relevant uh, from the sense of, uh, uh, approaching architecture and particularly in the context of uh, what you mentioned as an expression for your creativity. Mm. Um, architecture to me uh, were a kind of a bottom-up approach. Um, I mentioned community was actually a very big part of my creation. I always enjoyed doing public art and public infrastructure and public like projects. Uh, so uh, the interesting things about the NGO that I founded uh, for kids uh, and the, the client that we have as a, a non-profit organization, they are all different like uh, government institutions, uh, different type of non-profit like partners. The agenda I have in architecture is to really engage the community and try to use this as a uh, medium to create something collectively uh, I, I would say something, uh, I'm, I'm going to bring a, a too specific example. So when we actually build the library with kids together, uh, we ask the kid to actually imagine what would they do in the future library. And then we also collect a lot of data from parents. Uh, what do they mean by learning in a library in the 21st century? And we also ask the teacher, how would they use the library differently knowing everything we know today, right? After COVID, after all this like virtual learning, right? So combining like the student actual like uh, sketches, the actual like measurement and their ideas uh, to like different survey to actual teaching methodology. Uh, you know, we end up creating a, a, a library that will actually a, a reaction to all of that. So, uh, you know, for me, architecture is a combination of like finding a way to engage people so that we ask the right question and we react in this like 
simple uh, form with simple space that had a certain function to bring out the best of uh, the ideas. You know, for me, that 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 is kind of the essence of architecture. Well, uh, uh, for me, growing up, uh, Hong Kong was identified earlier with Britain, right? And yeah. uh, then, uh, of course, there was a historical association of China, and then mm -hmm. we watched China taking over. So, as an yeah. as a creative person and as an architect, mm -hmm. uh, the Britain is a very symbol of West, yeah. right? And China yeah. pretty much the East. So, you grew up. Uh, you're a native of a place which has seen. Perhaps Hong Kong is a place yeah. where West and East met, apart from India, of course, in different countries. Yeah. Uh, but how uh, you grew up in the cusp of it, right? While it was yeah. administered by British. Yes, yes, I did. Yes. And so how much of this uh, uh, one cultural aspect of West and East mm. and two, yeah. the politics of West and East influenced you from a creative perspective and mm. your architectural effort. Mm. That's actually a really interesting point of view. Uh, I'm going to point it out uh, in terms of, um, uh, it's not so much of the East versus the West, but it's almost like a creative like mentality to be the own and one -y. Uh, the own and, own, uh, well, I, I should say the one and only uh, creative like, person. Uh, and this mentality is actually quite evident in, I, I would say right now in, in China, it's very evident. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bring it down in really simple terms, right? Uh, so when I work in, say, in uh, the US, uh, they will ask me, okay, have you done this before? Is this really safe? Do you have a track record to create a certain building or to create a library? And if I say I haven't done that before, I won't even get selected to continue with my journey as the architect for the library mm -hmm. because they, uh, you know, with public money, they, they need someone who are very safe that they could trust with their public money. But here in China, uh, because they're relatively new with like a lot of like, public infrastructure, they would come and ask me, it's like, have you done this before? And I was like, no. And then they would be asking, it's like, has anyone else done it before? And I said, no. And then that's great, they said, because they wanted to be the one and only to be doing this for the first time. And I, as a creative like, person, I actually really love the mentality. It was like, uh, okay, I, I see two two sides of the uh, argument, right? One is being like uh, very reputable, very uh, creating the trust. But the other one is that, uh, willing to take the risk to be innovative. Uh, I mean, they're go both good for for architects, but at the same time, as a ra rather like I'm rather young uh, in the field of architecture, uh, a, as a rather young architect, I actually enjoy this like newer mentality I'm seeing in China right now, uh, pushing me to be the only one to do something that has never been done before. It end up like I end up doing you know urban farm that no one actually have like you know done before uh we're doing a lot of really crazy stuff not so not, none of them is commercial many community projects but in them uh they we get to innovate a lot of stuff that are helping the environment helping people and really try to use the project to pull a lot of like education children and uh you know uh wisdom together wonderful uh well uh I think that's a very interesting story. In fact, I've, I've, I'm kind of familiar with that in the startup context from mm. China where uh, people uh, have even met some of these startup founders who actually got money very fast, very easy. And at the same time, uh, when they didn't scale fast enough, uh, the investors withdrew and pulled the mm. ship down. So, uh, uh, but what is nice is that uh, the access to capital was that easy. So, and mm. it is... Good to learn that uh, it's just not in the startup space that uh, even in mm. the architecture, so many, it looks like it is the way in every other sector as well, which is very inspiring. In fact, unfortunately, uh, much of the things I have seen in Indian context, it would be similar to what your experience was in US. It would come down to 
who's done that have you done that before and if you have not done that then no we would like to work with somebody who's been there done that so mm. so uh, so that is i think uh, that's that's really amazing so another thing i want to uh, ask you in uh, uh, when you approach you know i've had uh, 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 i don't know if you had a chance to look at my uh, earlier podcast particularly with uh, uh one gentleman who has uh, come from uh, architecture background uh, who runs a architecture school as well and uh, a foundation and he also runs a very thriving practice works on the uh, mm. you know sustainable uh, architecture yeah. and uh, an indian of course and uh, uh, so uh, much of the conversation was on, around the material and sustainability mm. so, how how important are those two in your approach uh, mm. well uh in terms of sustainable design uh you know choosing the right material is one of the best way to lower carbon footprint uh so i think uh i look at it holistically not just the material but how do you manage it how do you operate it what type of uh, energy consumption we have so i i i mean there's a lot of certificate that are existing uh, around the world um in in asia the, or in hong kong we have like different standard uh in us in india they also have that different like uh, green building standard but long story short uh i always believe that we have to look at the project holistically not just uh, uh we have to do everything listed in the guideline to to achieve this like uh sustainable goal including using the right material using the right design passive design active design uh we cycle uh material all the way up to like renewable energy but i think it's more important to kind of look at this project as a a a decades long project uh you know things to break down right uh when things break down how do we replace them and uh, so the whole life cycle of the building design has to be uh, uh considered uh and for me i'm all, almost more interested uh not just uh to the uh, building and operation of it but how do we build this together with the community uh that lead to sustainable result was actually quite fascinating to me uh one of the reason farm and it's actual farm that we uh, are doing uh, in china what we did last year was that we collected a bunch of like trash uh literally um different type of wood that people threw away and then we we piled them around a pond uh, just a, just a pond of water we put fish in the pond of water and then we tied covid medicine or it's chinese basically chinese medicine different type of herbs but we tied them to this like uh, tree that we found we retrofitted right so at the end we created a landscape right the landscape has fish in them has like a different water plant in them you know all this like sculpture uh, now has become the basis for covid like plant to grow on top and at the same time when people kind of look around it's like that. so what did you do what kind of material you use and and you also just everything you see in, in front of you are basically like trash that people threw away we just add the like plant and water and boom then you, you created a really beautiful farm you know that story in the process we also work with the local farmers work with the kid to pe- build part of it so to me like um i think the long term goal hitting the sustainable target uh getting to net zero is, is important but at the same time trying to make the building process very meaningful for the community is also like part of the things that i care a lot well uh, there have been a lot of uh, conversation uh, uh, in the styling or uh, uh, designing uh, uh, mm. space for living space for work post covid mm. uh, 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 in fact covid got us to do a lot of work from home and uh, yeah. of hygiene habits right as soon as you get yes. home, first thing cleaning yeah. so a uh, lot of these things has brought a lot of conversation about uh any more new uh, any more new constructions the very design approach will be different from the pre covid so there mm-hmm. will be era of pre and post covid from this perspective so right. do you agree with this argument and mm-hmm. do you see that happening in your own work yes yes uh well the answer to your uh, two questions like first yes i do agree that uh post covid the architectural design has changed drastically 
Well, there's so many changes, right? I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert in all type of like uh, design, but I'm just going to talk about uh, my the things that I know a lot, uh, community, the center, library, all those like public infrastructure, right? Uh, after COVID, right, uh, we were asked to avoid uh, doing uh, a lot of like details, say uh, on the wall surface, right? Try to make everything very smooth. The reason being like, just a lot easier to clean. You know, I, I think that's a good change, right? Uh, not too difficult to do, uh, but it reflected our current understanding of how to clean a building. So, you know, that is easy to do from an interior design point of view. And in terms of like office design and community center design, right? Uh, things has, has become quite flexible. Uh, when we do the library, um, uh, we also learned something quite interesting. Uh, we thought after COVID, all the kids, all the little kids will be like, yeah, yeah, let's just read iPad, right? And after we do the survey, it actually told us the very opposite. The survey told us that they read way too much and way too many iPad. They are telling us, little kids are now telling us that I want to read more physical books. So we also see kind of the opposite trend oh. by having... This is interesting. Yeah, they want to see more. They want to see more books. That's that was why we have to expand the library in the first place. So, anyway, after COVID, the survey right, was a, uh, where? Uh, where was this survey done? Oh, that that was done in uh, Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, we live really close together. So during COVID, everyone stayed at home uh, during the lockdown, and so that the kid, everyone actually go to class on their iPad. So that was kind of the moment that really hit them. And then after that, everyone said, now I, I we don't like that. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, for adults, it's, it's quite different. Uh, many, many of our clients in university are now telling us that you know, classroom doesn't actually work as a classroom. We have to make them into a flexible space. So a lot of this like community uh, engagement in a university level is kind of uh, going uh, in a very different direction. It's more kind of spread out, a lot more like uh, of the open air, less air condition, more like, you know, kind of uh, net, uh, landscape, more natural environment for people to hang out. So um, I'm not an expert in all type of building design, but in general, the things that I know a lot is like all this like community all the way from little kid to elderly center, to all the way to like uh, college school campus. Uh, they have different approach uh, and they, they and, and quite honestly, it's so drastically different, right? Some kid wanted to be more physical. Some people wanted it to be easy to clean, but some people wanted it kind of spread the product uh, and, and they're okay with like doing everything virtually. So I, I, I am actually quite uh, eager to learn what is uh, here to come next, but I, I can't quite tell that there's a perfect one solution for all this like different type of like building, but uh, it, it's very interesting that we did change and I think it could be a very good uh, direction. Right. Well, you had a, uh, you, had an education also in uh, uh, outside, right? I mean, you studied in. Uh, oh uh, yeah, I did. Uh, I did study. Uh, well, I grew up in Hong Kong, and then I went to New York in the U.S. to obtain my uh, university degree, and then I became a licensed architect in the U.S. Uh, and then I also actually founded my practice uh, and. Uh, started to do different community service uh, in New York. And then after that, I moved back to Hong Kong, uh, hoping to expand some of my uh, idea in China because the, the land uh, with specifically agricultural land uh, farming was a big topic for me on how to use that as a medium to to kind of tie a city and a community together. Uh, they were very open to do some of that in China. So we ended up building a couple of really cool a community farm uh, that engaged the public and and then all the children around it. Um, so so uh, that was kind of um how 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 I moved back like from I I was in Hong Kong but I moved to US but then I moved back to China in order to continue my journey and my search for uh, you know better better location to exercise some of my uh, sustainable idea. Well, uh, want to understand uh, were there points of time where uh... Uh, first, when you went to US and uh, studying there, were there any fundamental change in the way you were thinking? Some things made you think differently, fundamentally, at a fundamental level. And again, when you moved back, 
to hong kong what the did you again experience any fundamental change in your own outlook of how you approach yes yes well uh, i'm going to talk about it uh, in terms of my learning my own learning as a student i'm going to then also talk about it as a teacher because i teach uh mm-hmm. well, i mean for my ngo architecture for children we are a non-profit and i teach at all these uh, cities so i'm going to also talk about it to in response to your question of how i see the difference between the different type of student i see Uh, across the, uh, the world. So when I was in Asia, you know, we are very focused on being uh, excellent in terms of like having good grade. Uh, we have to kind of compete for the number one position. Uh, everything is very die hard. Die hard meaning like, you know, the, the, if you really fail, the, the, there's not much room for you to do something else differently. You really have only one way to succeed, which is to get really good grade and then get into a good school. Uh, I, of course, like, you know, I, I was being very lucky to be kind of like, I was lucky enough that I was able to obtain the good grade. So, you know, I, I did well uh, still in Hong Kong. Uh, when I moved to the U.S., uh, you know, the education was just a piece of cake for me because the education I got in Asia was already way ahead of what I was doing in U.S. That's so true. the math with the math and everything i I'm, i'm sure that you felt the same the math was just super easy for me in the us oh, okay. Okay. Right. yeah so but then the, the the cultural shock for me at the time where that like uh, that was the time when i get to engage public art uh, my teacher in my high school in the us was teaching me how to actually uh, make art for the school really really big corner that we get to paint and uh, create murals uh, create ideas he was teaching me about diversity how people that I draw on the wall has to represent different color of the face, have to represent different religion. And to me, that was like, wow, I could be taught about all the gray, but diversity is something that I have to, I have to learn in the process. And, you know, they have different value that they care. And I learned a lot about that cultural value and the diversity that they care. So, so that was also excellence. So going back, as I now grew up uh, and I teach in both locations, I also teach in U- U.S. I also teach in India. I, I did taught a, a class in India. I also Where taught. In India? Uh, I was actually in um, New Delhi. Uh, we had oh, just okay. uh, one 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 class. Uh, but but anyway, uh, what I learned about uh, something in it. Um, I think different culture produce different type of like kids, and it could be good for this kid to really understand that whatever that they're doing may not be the one and only solution. Uh, we should be also looking at all type of solution, right? I'm going to say uh, one example. When I teach kids in the U.S., every kid in the U.S. are super confident. They know they could be the best. They know they can do all the stuff, right? They are so confident in a way that they will not listen to me, right? They will be like, Yeah, I know how to do this. You don't have to tell me anything because I know everything already. And for me as a teacher, that could actually be quite difficult, right? Yes, sometimes if they're really talented, they get to where they wanted to get. But it's also very easy for them to not go anywhere <laughs> because they're just so full of themselves, right? Uh, so I see one issue with that education, right? They have really confidence if they, they if they're already talented, right? That confidence actually is going to excel them in, in whatever they're doing. But if they are not so lucky to have that uh, talent, right, uh, then, then it's actually not too good for them uh, to be so confident. But here in Asia, right, sometimes like uh, kids are more obedient in classroom. They listen to the rules. They listen to their teachers, right? And sometimes the, 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 the result could be quite amazing. I don't even know how to describe it. I'm going to talk about it in the India context. But what, When what I teach is the age in, group? Uh, they are like 10 to 12. Uh, so, Same age uh, group in the U.S.? India, yes, Kong? yes, okay, yes, okay, um, yeah. So in India, we taught also this um a group of like twelve uh, student. Uh, we were teaching them about city planning. Uh, we gave them a really simple exercise. I said, use their name, that their, their their own personal name, create a three D object that looks like a building, and using that, uh, we have to create a function to them. Say, I'm creating uh, a library, and the next guy said, I'm creating creating a school and then every one of them has to put together their building in a community so that by the time we're done everyone has their own building using their name and then uh, they can form a community and then it's interesting that I was first time I, I understand at the time that uh, India also separated like uh, boys in one 
one side of the classroom, or at least the classroom was in and girls in the other side. And then the building that they create was very surprising that it looks so drastically different. And because uh, when I was in India, I, I, I told them that you don't have to limit your building design using your English name. You could use other other language that you, you know. And then so 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 the all the girls decided to use like, you know, their own native language. And then they created this like, really beautiful building of their names. And then it has like, you know, uh, amazing design to it. And the boys also has this like more English Western centric design to them that are uh, using letter. So when they are put together, this like this tan, I, I, I'm looking at this like table of like 12 buildings. Uh, I call this like a little community, right? It was like, wow, what a diversity I get here, right? Well, one side of the town is like, wow, very decorative detail design. And the other side is like very bulky, very like uh, chunky. So what, what, what I wanted to say is that, okay, I, you know, back to Asia, when I look at the education system, yes, uh, we are so used to this more disciplined uh, classroom, uh, this system. But in, in some way, it doesn't actually stop them from being creative, right? Uh, they listened right. to me. They were they were a lot more quiet than the one I have in the U.S. Everyone's very quiet. But they finished the exercise and they, they see some amazing result together. So well, what, what I wanted to learn is that during the process, they were so quiet. None of them were confident about what they were doing. But yet the result was actually amazing. So... So yeah, so I, I see both sides of the coin. I I I enjoy both sides of this like education system, uh, but at the same time, I still can't decide how whether one system is better than the other yet. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's it, it's not really. Uh, I don't know. It's very unfortunate that we always try to put things as this versus that, or what is better in terms yeah. of trying to. Uh, mm. Each has its own uh, uniqueness, but uh, I just wanted to understand your experience of India with uh, the Delhi part, and uh, how I see Hong Kong is Hong Kong has also had a lot of Indian diaspora, right, for uh, more than hundred years. So, uh, have you had opportunity to interact with Indian diaspora in uh, Hong Kong? And uh, I'm not sure if you had an opportunity to interact with the Indian diaspora in New York when you were there. And then you are, uh, obviously have interacted with Indians in Delhi. So I yeah. just wa- was trying to get your perspective. Was there? Did you find any difference? Uh, or what difference did you find from the people uh, who are perhaps today mm. Hong Kong citizens in, of Indian origin to the American citizens of Indian origin oh. and the Indian oh. citizens of Indian origin that you interacted with? How do you map them? Oh, wow. Um, well... Uh, one of my partners, I, I, in order to do all this like, community engagement, I, I do have for, like partners. Uh, so my partners are actually Indian. Uh, I mean, she was born in India, but spent quite a bit of time traveling in the world. Uh, she's trained, uh, her name is like, Sujata Govada. Well, she's a very well-known uh, urban designer, urban planner. Uh, and then, so we worked a lot here in Hong Kong together on projects. Uh, so I... You know, the way I, I love working with her is that she, she had this really rich culture uh, she respect uh, uh, of her Indian background. And then when she attend all this like really formal uh, architectural meetings, uh, she was actually dressed in this like uh, very formal Indian outfit. And that really kind of like kind of tell everyone who she is, what she believed, and then how her differences is going to bring the diversity to the, to the project. And this is something that I'm actually quite happy to see what my other Indian colleagues are, are also doing in Hong Kong and in the U.S. Uh, they don't shine away from their own culture. They celebrate it. They celebrate it not only personally, but they celebrate it at workplace. Uh, mm-hmm. That's not something I, a Chinese really do. I, I don't really dress like in really formal Chinese outfit <laughs> in a business meeting, right? right? I just don't do that, right? But but yet uh, she does. And, and it really got my respect that, wow, actually there are something I should be thinking. You know, what is the identity that really makes me who I am? And she clearly had that identity and it got reflected on her fashion design. It got reflected on the way she speaks. It got reflected on the way she teach and work. So I, she, every day she's telling me something that's also quite diff- interesting in business that I have to share this. I'm always so stressed out that, wow, the, you know, 2024 is a very tough year globally for a lot of businesses, right? And then she's like, 
you just have to meditate. We will get through this. <laughs> and, that, and and that and I'm sure that you know the, the whole idea of like meditation is kind of tied into her whole belief in in professional design. But but yet it's a very spiritual thing that I I believe that many uh, many Indian that I get to know also practice that right. So and I really enjoy that uh, that wow uh, the they uh, um, the group of people in India managed to kind of form this very nice spiritual thing that can influence how they work professionally and i really love that and and I, quite honestly i i think it it will probably help me a lot if i get to learn some of this technique too <laughs> wonderful and how do you see this aspect from your u.s experience how do I, i'm sorry uh, can you repeat the so question? how yeah. do you uh, uh in this context of mm. uh, uh uh the experience that you have and you're having and you had Uh, how do you relate to uh, the Indians that you met or interacted with in New York while you were there oh. uh, was studying and working? Was how different was it? I and mean, I'm just curious oh. to get your perspective. It actually, I don't think it's actually quite different. I, I mean, as a, oh, as, a fact, okay. of, as a matter of fact, one of my employee is actually uh, Indian uh, at the moment. Uh, so, so it. Um, I, I felt like the people that I met in India are all well. Well, I have to say, when they talk to me, they talk to me in English. So I I don't know whether that that actually I mean uh that also make the, my experience well on my from my perspective right it's actually quite equal right it doesn't matter if I go to India or if I go to New York if I speak to Indian I don't really speak in Indian right I, they're still talking to me in English so in some way that kind of make the difference quite or 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 is the for my experience is quite similar. Uh, but um, overall, I, I, um, well, that, that's actually one thing that uh, kind of shocked me uh, when I was in India. I would have to say that like uh, people are willing to take more risk uh, than they are outside of the country. Uh, well, there's something that really still kind of shocked me. I'm sure not too many people does that, right? When I was in New Delhi, when I actually visited the train, Uh, I guess the train is always so crowded that some people have to kind of get on the outside of the train, you know, to, to move like forward. And I'm like, wow, wow. Like, you know, for many people like me who live in Hong Kong, it's like not only we will never be allowed to to do that, but at the same time, it's like, wow, it's quite a risk just to actually get from one location to another. So so that moment also kind of like uh, was a, a cultural shock for me. And the uh, second cultural shock for me is also related to transportation. I was uh, I landed in New Delhi at three in the morning. Wow, there, there's just so many cars in the cities. I didn't even know that was actually three in the morning. Wow, it's just wow. The, when we tell people that Hong Kong never sleeps, but and I'm like, man, that's such a lie. Look at New Delhi. No, no they literally don't even sleep. <laughs> so that <laughs> yeah, that was actually a cultural shock for me in terms of the the way they work in India. Yeah. Right. Well. Uh, uh... You 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 talked about uh, your partner and the spirituality. I I just am curious: uh, is spirituality an aspect in your effort, in your design aspects when you work on a project? How much do you uh, consider spirituality, or is that a thing that has to come to you from the customer or the client? The client has to say that there has to be this, or is it something that you also actively think? Uh, how how is that? I think it's like uh, a very bottom-up approach. Uh, it also depends on the client. Uh, okay, so uh, I just, I mean, you know why MCA, uh, which is, you know, a global non-profit organization. I just came back from them. We are doing a new community center uh, with them. So on day one, we already established an idea. Uh, we are saying that we have to go out and talk to the people of how they wanted to, to use the center. We let them tell us how they wanted to do it, right? But that's only one third of it, right? Some people still have to kind of operate the site. They have to pay for the utility. People who are paying for the utility still have to tell me how to minimize some of the impact uh, uh, to make the operation easy and uh, also kind of uh, uh, affordable. And for me as a designer, I have an agenda in sustainable design. How do I make this design green? How do I make this like also uh, impactful for everyone that I'm working with? 
So I can't say it's not even a 50 50 design, right? Some people give us like 33% of the input, the other people give us like 33%, and I do some other 33%. So kind of every idea can kind of merge and gel together. And it's not, it doesn't happen overnight, right? We have two different options, right? Let's try our, our option one. If it doesn't work, we keep refining it, refining it until we get to an answer that everyone likes. Uh, the type of architecture I like uh, is quite time consuming. I don't build them overnight. One of the non-profit projects I'm building it uh, right now uh, took me about six years already. We are building a sustainable temple. Uh, the temple worship a, a Taoist god uh, here in China. And then, but the client already told us that uh, we have to be able to get away from the old way of thinking. Uh, to them, they believe their God is all related to nature. So they tell us that uh, they wanted the design to be very connected to nature. It's about the relationship between us and the greater environment. So the, the, the building itself has a lot of innovative like ideas in it. But the reason it took so long is that after we do the whole construction, we go in with the partners and, and, and we ask them, like, hey, does it really work like this? And then as we are building it, we keep refining it. Even as we we are very close to finishing the whole construction after six years now, we're still kind of touching up some of the details. Like, yeah, let's do it differently. So for me, uh, to answer your question, it's like, uh, I, I'm not that genius that I could come up with an idea overnight. But over a longer period of time, I, I, I'm very patient. I could actually stay with my client uh, to kind of come up collectively with them with a solution that respond to their original vision so that that's what i really love to do uh, i i don't call myself a genius uh, i just find myself to be very hard working and i'm very patient to do all these like steps and uh, options with them yeah. right uh, well i've uh, i've seen some works by some architects and uh, i also have interacted with a few uh, many of them uh, uh, in fact, many, a lot of, lot many of them like to uh, like to leave behind a signature in their work, right? Uh, they they want it to be reflecting something of themselves, yeah. even though it is supposed to be a client's work, right? I mean, you are doing it as a client's work, but uh, you want to see something of yourself. So, uh, if you have to look at some of your work. Yeah. Now, what has been that something of you that you have tried to leave as a signature? I mean, uh, I mean, how mm -hmm. do you symbolize your signature? How do you like to mm -hmm. symbolize? Because each design has to look different from a client's expectation. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. so, but how do you symbolize your signature there? Uh, uh, do, you, uh, do you approach it uh, uh, physically or do you approach it in uh, any different way? How do you mm -hmm. approach it? I, I believe my signature is less about the result. I mean, some of them is also about the result. Uh, I, I, well, I'm going to give the really easy answer first, right? If you look at my work, uh, many of them has like kids in them. Many of them uh, have a lot of plants in them. So it's very green. It uh, has a lot of people in them, right? That's kind of like the, the things I love, right? It, it, it's just to put as much like... Uh, a greenery on my building as many locations for people to gather uh, that's the type of the things that I, I love and enjoy and for my client uh, they usually hire me because they know I know how to put this type of like uh, style that they like it there's a lot of like uh, uh, fresh and greenery a lot of like uh, kind of people hang out like location uh, so that, that's all, all more on the physical and aesthetic side uh, and on the process and the the, the 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 kind of the process that I go through as an architect, I enjoy just working with the community. You know, that to me is actually quite a signature. Um, simply put it this way, they they know that I don't turn my back and kind of walk away. They know I will have the patience to uh, stay with them. And I always kind of like do these workshops with a bunch of people at the beginning. Uh, and then I also do them at the very end of the project. Uh, another community center that we're finishing, I, I'm actually teaching the kid uh, to kind of finish painting part of the wall. So the kid are actually doing the painting. So for me, it was not just the beginning when they do the ideas and now they get to paint part of it. 
the other farm that we're building in China, uh, we are building part of the bamboo lighting. Uh, so the, the, the kids also get to build some of the lighting fixture with us. So, and we get it hand on, on the actual architecture. So for me, uh, the, the process is uh, uh, there are things that I like and I will try to uh, promote it to the client. But then also uh, this process that I enjoy even more, if the kids get to be an architect themselves in the project that I do, I feel more proud that I no longer have to be the only architect. I'm actually co-designing with all of them. Well, uh, if, uh, if you were... I mean, I, I want to know, uh, who do you regard as uh, people who inspired you? Uh, is it uh, your teachers or uh, uh, some... Uh, uh, what what inspires you and who inspired you? Wow. Um, you know, uh, I actually give this question. Uh, you asked me this question earlier. I, I give it some thought. Uh, I... I actually wanted to answer the, your question in 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 two direction it, in two phases of my life. Uh, my 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 pursuit of uh or my idol has changed. Uh, I'm going to talk about my first idol, and I'm now I'm going to talk about my second idol. Uh, my my first idol originally uh, when I first started my company, I really enjoy the person who founded Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. He's successful. He's uh, actually quite young. And then he has the mission of uh, trying to connect the world. I, I found the mission to be very admirable. Uh, and he has the method to do it. And not only he do it, but he did it so quickly, so fast, that he became so powerful and impactful. Uh, so that was kind of my earlier kind of like uh, idol that inspired me to try to pull together the, the community, connect the dots and then create this platform that I'm not the only one who create, as we co-create, right? So some of the idea I had were, were kind of like inspired by the things that I've seen from him, yeah. But as I get older and older, I, I realized that I would never be able to get to the speed of some of this technology company. You know, they become instantly famous overnight. Uh, many of them do, uh, at least like uh, from what I read from the news. Uh, for me, you know, one of my latest idols uh, can easily be the uh, I.M. Pei, uh, one of the late architect. Um, uh, well, he, he passed away um, a few years ago, but he left the footprint of like great architecture that he took sometimes like decades to build. Uh, when he was still the age of like one or two, like one hundred and two years old, he was still working trying to build project. And I'm really looking at him. He was like, yes. I could idolize someone who are so young and so successful, but I, for me, someone who are still at the age of like 102, but yet still working, try to make the impact is actually even a better idol. I should look up to someone who spent almost like a century into trying to build something good for the community. And, and now my new idol is to become someone like that. If I can spend more time, well, for me, it was actually at least like five more decades, right? If I can spend the next five decades trying to you know connect people like him, uh, you know that would be like wow, very inspirational. Yeah. Uh, do you uh, want to recommend some books or podcasts that you follow uh, for our uh, yes. listeners? Yep. Yes. That, uh, there are actually uh, two books I'm going to talk about in, in two different extremes. Uh, in architecture, there's a famous book called uh, The Fountain Head. Uh, basically, it's the journey of the architect. Um, and uh, you're, it, it you're referring about... to Ayn Rand? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, anyway, it's, it has a, politi a very political message about uh, you know uh, uh, things that she was trying to promote. But uh, you know, being an architect, uh, at the very beginning, I kind of agree with what you said, right? There are visions that we have to defend uh, at, at what cost, uh, at, at, even if it has to kind of like uh, do a lot of damage, we still have to kind of defend the value that we, we care as an architect, right? But now I, I kind of look past that, right? Uh, I, I, find, I find that to be too egoistic, too self-centered. Uh, my newer book that I, uh, so I, I like that book. I also, you know, have a new phase and new transition right so the, my younger me kind of like that but my older me is now more into uh this new book uh well it's not it's an old book the the class beat game 
the Gar Split game uh, also by well they he win the Prisca Prize uh, for 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 uh, in literature. And then this book is just about a journey of a man trying to go through different religion, different knowledge. Uh, oh, oh, can you come knowing... again with the name? Can you come again with the name? Oh, the the glass bleed game, like like the the glass like uh, just like glass, uh, 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 like glass. Yeah, and then uh, bleed is like the like the marble. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the, the the journey of the book is about this young man. He started really young, and then he was trying to accomplish his like mission, but without even knowing it, that uh, other people other people keep assigning him new tasks that he didn't want to do, but yet he did it anyway. So after he did like uh, ten tasks, twenty tasks, and every time he got a new skill, and he became eventually he became so powerful. He became the head of this like school who look after the. Uh, this organization and i found that to be quite interesting that he i, I find myself that in my journey to be interesting uh, similarly uh i don't really wanting to be trying to achieve certain goal i just wanted to help the community but along the way a lot of people assign me tasks to okay let's do this let's do that together and then every time i say yes and as i get older i learn skill and then eventually Without knowing it, now I'm actually an owner of like you know six different NGOs, uh, and then I look after a lot of like a project for the community, and you know so I I found that to be quite inspirational for the older me to to kind of look at this book. It's like wow, actually, uh, some people always ask me to kind of find a vision and mission in life. You know, I, oh, I have, have you like, read uh, it by Herman Hell? Have you read this book, Siddhartha? Oh yes, yes, yes. That is by by the same uh, author. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, he so got the Nobel book. Nobel Prize for uh, literature yes. for that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that was basically a, a little bit of adoption. I mean, story coming from India. So yes. Uh, so that that I got it. But this is interesting. We'll look it up. Yes. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. but uh, it's actually a very, very similar story. It, uh, yeah, it's like, basically almost the same story, but with a different background. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually felt that. I, I recall reading and I mm-hmm. thought it's very similar to Siddhartha. Yeah. Uh, and podcasts that you follow? What? what? Podcasts? Do you follow any podcasts? Uh, well, I follow your podcast. Uh, and then uh, at the moment, I I don't spend a lot of time to uh uh um on on podcasts uh, at the moment uh you know, the community got me quite busy so uh, most of my free time is already spent kind of like uh, dealing with like community and NGOs uh, so I haven't yet uh, uh followed too many people like on social media yeah all right wonderful and uh uh before we conclude this part and uh, uh, shift, I, I just wanted to, uh, if you ha- uh, have to uh, motivate people to take up architecture, right? Why why should people be taking up architecture as an option, as a career, as a profession? Oh, yeah. Well, um, architecture training was actually a very uh, general study in terms of like people building natural science, geography, uh, history. Uh, so uh, my background, when I was at the very beginning of my career, I, I get to really learn many things. And and quite frankly, uh, many of my classmates eventually took that skill and transitioned that into other different uh, uh, industry. Uh, they are sometimes in business Sometimes they are in photography. Uh, sometimes they're in like um, doing 3D printing. Uh, but yet they apply some of the, the, the background knowledge that they have understand uh, in terms of like uh, finding good form that would respond to the problem, you know, finding a solution that will really deal with like people's. Uh, so I think architecture training get me that um, that kind of like uh, that knowledge to be successful in uh, in Korea. Not to say that other profesh- profession doesn't do that, but it, uh, that's from my experience uh, as a uh, actual architect, uh, I found that to be a very good way to kind of get me into design thinking. And that design thinking 
it's actually good for a business. Uh, so I, I found that to be my the prime clauses uh, to prepare me to run my own business. And of course, like, at the end of the day, I keep on telling other people, it's like, you know, don't, uh, you, you, just because you like architecture, I don't think it necessarily have to become an architect, right? Uh, so I think that the training and all my classmates kind of did the same, right? They love it. They like it. They went through the study, but eventually they didn't go through to become one. Uh, they end up uh, pursuing different uh, careers. So I, I felt like that could also be true today. Uh, I see many of the students that I taught, uh, I taught them architecture, right? They grew up becoming something very different. But I, I believe that some of the knowledge that they told me specifically on creative thinking and design thinking, they're telling me that they could still apply that uh, to other field of study and career that they are using. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, uh, Vicky. This is uh, very interesting, and I'm sure our audience and listeners also find it interesting. And I really urge you to please share it with those who you think will appreciate this conversation. And uh, please share it, and also do come back soon, because we're going to have uh, more conversation and now diving more into uh, uh, what keeps uh, Vicky and busy, and uh, most importantly, I, I was thinking about one uh, NGO, but he, he just mentioned that there are six NGOs that he's uh, busy with apart from his business. So we'll be diving into that conversation. So do join in. And uh, till we meet again, enjoy the ride. Vicky, once again, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. Thank you for having me. <laughs>